Welcome everyone to another exciting edition of AW Mania, the recap show. I'm your host JP and today we're going to be recapping WWE Smackdown Live, Smackdown on Fox from March 6th, 2020. It was it was an interesting show to say the least. Uh, it felt like it flew by, if I'm going to be honest. Uh, a lot of stuff was just quickly produced and quickly done in terms of the matches and even in terms of like the, the promos and segments that were on the show. The show opened up pretty quickly. It opened up with um, a moment of bliss. It opened up with Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross in the ring, introducing the NWO. Uh, out came the NWO, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and uh, X-Pac, or Sean Waltman, or 123Kid, whatever you would like to call them. Out, out they came. Uh, Alexa ran through uh, their list of accomplishments and how they dominated in, in WCW and how they're now going to be within the Hall of Fame. And how three out of the four members are two-time Hall of Fame members. Uh, and eventually, they may be even more time Hall of Fame members. Hulk Hogan's in the Hall of Fame for himself personally. Now he's going to be in there for the NWO. X-Pac is in there for the uh, DX. And now for the NWO. Kevin Nash is in there because, well, he's Kevin Nash. And for now, the NWO. So there's a lot of moving parts. And a lot of people are going to be in the Hall of Fame for more than one reason, whether they're a part of a group or, or whether it's because uh, they're inducted for their, their own accomplishments that they had within the WWE or their WCW tenure. So out comes the NWO. Nikki uh, lists their list of accomplishments. Uh, they don't really get to say much. Uh, X-Pac did most of the talking for this segment. Um, Scott Hall kind of seemed a little lost and preoccupied or not even sure what was going on, which made things strange because a lot of time he just picked up the mic and, and respond with, uh, oh, what they said. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, be careful. It, it, it was a lot of he either wasn't aware or maybe that's what that's all he wanted to say. And Nash was a little bit more in, in, with within the, the segment. He he was trying to give uh, responses, long-winded responses, rather than one-word answers or just pretending like he wasn't paying attention. Uh, Sean Waltman was into it. He was having a good time with the crowd. He was trying to get them hyped up and into it. And out comes Cesaro, Shinsuke Nakamura, uh, Shin, Shinsuke Nakamura and uh, Sami Zayn. So out comes this trio, and just right off the bat, you know something's going to be brewing. They're going to try and be pushing to a confrontation, even though we know that we 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 already know that the the NWO members are not going to be getting involved in a physical capacity in this in this segment. Uh, let's face let's face facts. Kevin Nash, at his age and with all the injuries that he sustained over the course of his career, he's not going to be getting into it. He's not going to be putting himself in harm's way to potentially be injured. Same goes for Scott Hall, uh, as a recovering alcoholic and as someone who uh, he's been injured more than once in, in his WWE career, in his WCW career, he's not going to be getting involved. And if there was anyone that was going to take a bump, it was most likely going to be Sean Waltman. Uh, but thankfully for everyone's safety, no one got hurt. No one was involved in any form or type of, of uh, altercation. So out come Sami Zayn, Cesaro, and Shinsuke. Uh, three of the most talented guys in, in, in the WWE, on the WWE roster, and on SmackDown, I would say. And also three of the most underutilized talents on the SmackDown roster that are just basically treated like second citizens and not necessarily given the push that they deserve. These guys are three of the best in-ring competitors, and over the course of the last year to two, three years, actually... They've just been mistreated, and, and and that goes for the case of Cesaro. He's one of your top talents, and he could be one of your top guys. His best run with the WWE was the, the tag team he formed with Sheamus. Uh, they went on a tear and won the tag team titles and, and were together for, for over a year. And, and it's unfortunate that they broke them up. Uh, I know Sheamus was injured, which is why they have to go to separate ways. But now... Out they come. Uh, they got the NWO in the ring. Sammy comes in the ring. He explains how um, your era is over. It's now our, our era. We're the new generation. Get out of our ring. Sean Waltman gets up. He asks them, are you challenging us to a fight? And if it's a fight you want, it's a fight you got. So now the, the stakes are set for a, a one -on, for a three-on-three competitive matchup. 
Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss back away to getting out of the way. Cue Braun Strowman's music. Out comes Braun for the save. Um, Cesaro and Shinsuke run up the entrance ramp to attack Braun Strowman. But Braun lays waste to them, which is what you expect. Uh, look, they don't treat Sami, Shinsuke, and Cesaro with the respect they deserve. And, and Braun just runs through them. Sami's left alone in the ring. Turns around, um, runs into Braun Strowman, gets thrown out of the ring. And that's the end of that segment. Braun announces that come the Elimination Chamber, he's going to beat all three of their asses and embarrass them. And he, they're going to get these hands. I don't know what the segment was for. We're all very well aware that the NWO is going to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. You're missing Hollywood Hulk Hogan there. So I don't know where he was or why he wasn't a part of this segment. Uh, to have the three other guys that are being inducted, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and, and X-Pac, and Sean Waltman in, in the ring and to barely even say a word besides Sean Waltman, I don't know. It, it didn't do really do much. It did for nostalgia purposes. I'm sure it's going to get a big ratings boost. Uh, people are, are, are fans of the NWO. They're fans of Nash. They're fans of Hall. So they're going to tune in for that. But apart from that, from making Shinsuke, Cesaro, and, and, and Sami Zayn look weak, I don't know. Uh, it didn't really build the match for me, the, the handicap match at the chamber. It didn't get me excited for that match. It didn't make me think that there's more of a chance that they're going to win against Braun Strowman. We move on next to the first match of the night. And the first match of the night was Naomi Lacey Evans and ba uh, Naomi, Naomi Lacey Evans versus Bailey and Sasha Banks. Um, this is one half of the Boston Hug Connection. This is the Boston Hug Connection taking on Naomi and Lacey Evans. Uh, they've been having... Naomi and Evans have been having their personal issues with with Bailey, uh, each trying to capture the the women's title, but Bailey's been getting the better of them, uh, especially with the help of Sasha Banks. And now that Sasha Banks is back, um, it seems like we've got ourselves a feud. Uh, at the same time, interesting note: um, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross address the fact that the um, the Kabuki Warriors are the tag team champions, and they haven't been seen for quite some time on SmackDown. And I believe they offered them a challenge for Mania. Uh, Alexa Bliss, Twisted Bliss versus, versus versus the Kabuki Warriors. We'll see what comes of that. We'll see if this turns into a just a standard tag team match or it becomes a, like your typical fatal four-way match to get all the women on the card as much as possible uh, so we could have ourselves all the women on the card rather than just a few. So we, we go through the tag team match. Um, Bailey and Banks get the better of them to get the one, two, three and quickly exit the ring. Uh, there, there wasn't much this match. The match starts, cuts to a commercial. They come back. Um, Carmella hits her big moves. Naomi hits her, her spots. But in the end, Bailey ends up securing the victory. And, and that's it. It didn't really matter. Didn't even tell more of a story than that. Um, I don't know what the lead up was. All I could say was it's good to see the, the heels go over for once. Uh, usually the faces get over a goofy win. But the heels the heels needed. Bailey needed the victory. Sasha Banks needed the victory. So that's the only positive I'm going to give that match. Apart from that, it was quick. It was quick and painless, I guess. Then we cut to Bray Wyatt. And then we cut, sorry, to Sheamus versus Apollo Crews. Before Apollo Crews goes out there to, to compete, he uh, runs into Chad Gable, or Shorty G, as we can call him. And Shorty G gives him a, a word of advice. If you need any help, I hear, I'm here. I've got your back. I'll be looking out for you. Apollo Crews just doesn't answer him and music hits and he goes down to the ring i don't know what they're doing with shorty g and apollo because they haven't been doing much with them over the years since apollo lost to aj styles he's basically been floating around and been taking a beating to buy either aj drew mcintyre um, anyone on the smackdown or raw roster roster anyone looking for a squash match has just been beating apollo sheamus has been running through chad gable uh, shorty g baron corbin ran through shorty g Look, Shorty G and uh, Apollo Crews fit in the same category of Sami Zayn, uh, Cesaro, and Shinsuke Nakamura. All very talented. Uh, hell, Shorty G and Apollo Crews may be the most athletic and talented people on your roster. If you decided to form a tag team with them, that wouldn't be the, the worst idea. At least it gives them a little boost. At least maybe they'll pick up a victory rather than being used as talent enhancement. Uh, Sheamus comes out. Um, Apollo... He, he's got some quick offense, you know, standing moonsault, all his flippy floppy moves. Sheamus just hits him with a boot, the bro kick, one, two, three. That's it. Painless match, less than maybe two, two, three minutes long. Sheamus picks up the victory. 
it's always good to see the WWE's putting over young talent. Uh, good to see Sheamus get the victory. That's sarcasm for those of you who missed it. I'm, look, I know Sheamus just came back from injury. I know he's one of your top heels right now. I guess we're trying to push him. But you're also killing the likes of Apollo and Shorty G, who've been killed multiple times over the course of their career so far. And I don't know how much more losses they could take. Hell, I, I can see these guys on any other... And then in, in, in any other company or specifically in AEW, and, and these guys would do wonders for them. Uh, they're phenomenal in-ring talents. I know the personalities on the mic aren't 100%, but let's look, if you gave them, if they gave them the reins to run and, and said, listen, go out there and give me a promo. No script, no nothing. Who knows what they would do? But in-ring, these are two of the best athletes and we've yet to see much from them we've yet to see them even given the opportunity so that's unfortunate Sheamus picks up the victory uh, I don't know who he's feuding with or what's going on he's just been beating these two guys over the last two weeks a few weeks since um since the rumble since the rumble he's just been beating these guys uh, I don't know what the plan is I'm hoping that the plan is to form a tag team it seems like that's where they're headed or maybe a handicap match against um against Sheamus but right now uh the, the Either keep them off TV or let's get them some victories because uh, you're hurting them. You're hurting them more than doing any positive to, to their careers. Um, then we cut to another tag team match. Tonight's SmackDown was basically filled with tag team matches. It was Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, Fire and Desire, taking on the Jobbers, Carmella and Dana Brooke. I don't mean to say the Jobbers in a negative way, but when was the last time Dana Brooke won a significant match that mattered? When was the last time that Dana Brooke was involved in a match where she picked up a victory and we were excited? She's just been losing and she took the loss in this match. Uh, uh, this match was a long eater. Uh, we had the entrances. Uh, we had about two, three minutes of action before we cut the commercial. We came back. We had another five minutes of action and then we had a pinfall. A uh, silly pinfall uh, where Fire and Desire pick up the victory, continuing their momentum, which is fine. Um, Mandy Rose has got a storyline going on with Dolph Ziggler and Otis. Sonya Deville is also involved in the storyline. I could see a little bit of a, a play over here going on. I could see from the Valentine's Day that did not occur where Otis was supposed to go on a date with Mandy Rose and there was some confusion and some delays and Otis received text messages and Mandy wasn't receiving any text messages, which then led to Dolph Ziggler's appearance. I wouldn't be too surprised if this was all a play by Sonya Deville and it leads to a feud between Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville because Sonya was jealous over the fact that Mandy was getting attention by Otis and getting attention by a man and was just jealous over the fact that her friend was going to be falling in love and leaving her out to dry. Uh, so this wouldn't surprise me if Sonya and Dolph do form a little couple or faction. I know Sonya is a lesbian, so we won't say she forms she becomes a couple with Dolph, but maybe she happens to be his friend and was involved in uh, in trying to keep Otis and Mandy from being together. Uh, that's a potential direction that they may be heading in in, in the near future because it seems like that's what they're teasing in terms of storyline purposes. Uh, it was announced that. Uh, the reason Dolph Ziggler came down to ringside for it with uh, Fire and Desire was because Sonya had specifically asked for him. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind that in your future we may see Sonya and Dolph uh, not teaming up, but like uh, the storyline leads that um, Sonya and Dolph work together to um, to cause the friction between Otis and Mandy Rose. Mandy Rose. So Dolph comes out to help. 14th faction within the last two years uh, this guy's just been bouncing around with, with people uh, he's he's a tag team with bobby Roode. he's friends with uh, baron corbin he's at one point friends with um drew mcintyre another point he's he's friends with uh rusev who knows what's going on with Dolph ziggler i don't even think he knows he probably just comes in each and every single week and the wdb creative is like oh hey by the way tonight you're gonna be going out to the ring with so and so so that match gets over fire and desire pick up the victory we then cut to Drew Gulak and uh, um, Drake Maverick in the back. Drake is saying that he's going to demand for a match against Daniel Bryan tonight live. He goes on to explain how he believes he could beat Daniel Bryan. Uh, Drew Gulak is a little hesitant and says that he knows all of Daniel's 56 moves. Uh, lo and behold, Daniel Bryan happens to be standing behind Drew, uh, Drew Gulak and Drake Maverick. And he challenges Drew Gulak to a match at uh, the Elimination Chamber. And to be honest, this may be the the one match that I'm most excited to see, apart from Aleister Black, AJ Styles, and the tag team, the Raw Tag Team Championship match. Uh, 
man, Daniel Bryan and Drew Gulak, if they're not on the pre-show, or maybe hell, if they are on the pre-show, they'll be able, be able to steal the show. Bryan can have a match, uh, a great match with almost anybody. Drew is a very talented individual, very good in-ring competitor. He's done very well for himself on 205 Live, but let's see what he can do on the main roster. And I'm super excited to see him and, uh, and Daniel Bryan get it on at the chamber. Uh, let's just hope they give him some time. Please give him some time. Uh, let's let, don't rush this match. Don't give us a two three minute match. Let's give them a let's give the fans a competitive match uh, because they can deliver. Bar none, they can deliver one of the most competitive and compelling matches at the Elimination Chamber pay per view. Uh, moving on from now, we have Bray Wyatt. He addresses John Cena. He he makes it clear. Listen, the reason he's going after John Cena is because John Cena defeated him at, at one of the WrestleMania pay per views, and it was from there that it kind of went downhill for Bray. His character, when he took the loss to John Cena, his character became a joke because here he was. He was coming out with the Wyatt family, the most dominant faction in pro wrestling at that time. And uh, he was beating everybody. And like John Cena, the same way he would happen with Rusev, where he beat Rusev and then Rusev's character just kind of flaundered around. Uh, the same happened with Bray Wyatt. And that's why here we've come full circle. And now The Fiend is here and The Fiend is blaming John Cena as to why he's been just destroying and 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 causing havoc on SmackDown, and and he's then that's why he challenged John Cena because he wants to get an exact revenge for what John Cena did to him years ago. That's a good reason. It, look, it, it comes full circle, and it's what we expected for with the moment that we were aware that John Cena would face Bray Wyatt. We kind of figured that the reason behind it was because John Cena picked up a victory against him at WrestleMania, and we're gonna. We're going to run that, that storyline full circle and we're going to have John Cena is going to have his WrestleMania match uh, this year and it's going to be one that matters. And I'm excited to see what they do. Uh, the only way you could ruin this is if you have John Cena beat The Fiend, which would make no sense. Uh, I'm telling you right now that The Fiend needs this victory. He lost to Goldberg, but The Fiend needs to defeat John Cena to continue on the path that he's going on, to continue being the most dominant heel slash face in the business. If he takes the loss to John Cena, how can we take The Fiend or Bray Wyatt serious? Uh, it was a quick Funhouse segment. It was just Bray explaining why he challenged Cena. And that was it. And then he said goodbye and told Cena, let him in. And I'll see you next week. It was simple. It wasn't anything complex that we've seen over the, the last couple of months from Bray Wyatt and The Funhouse. I was kind of surprised by that. But I guess quick is better. Uh, they had a long gauntlet match to get to. And that happened to be the next match. So we had ourselves a gauntlet match with each and every single tag team involved in the, the Elimination Chamber. So Heavy Machinery defeats Big E by hitting the trash compactor on him. They pin him within 8 minutes and 25 seconds of the match. Um, next out comes Grand Metalik and Lince Dorado, two members of the Lucha House Party. A heavy Machinery, they, they do battle for, for quite some time. This was the longest match, uh, the longest uh, th these two teams were in the ring, the longest of all the teams, 12 minutes about. Um, Otis follows up and hits the caterpillar, caterpillar on on the Lucha House Party. He picks up the victory. Uh, out come the Usos. Uh, that that, that, that didn't last very long. Um, under maybe five minutes that they were in the ring. Uh, Jimmy and Jay Uso, they come out uh, from the break. The, they knock one of the Usos off the apron. Uso gets super kicked by Tucker. And Tucker picks up the cover. The one, two, three. Uh, Miz and Morrison next were to come out. Um, they also were not that long in the match, about five minutes too. Uh, they end up getting eliminated by Tucker. He catches Morrison in an inside cradle and pins him for the one, two, three, which then leads to your final two competitors to come out. It's Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode. They compete for a good 12 minutes, which is a good length of a match, which is a good length for this, for this team, uh, leaving the overall length of the match was about 42 minutes and 30 seconds. Dolph Ziggler super kicks Otis. He catches him with the kick. Uh, pins him one, two, three, continuing the storyline between Dolph Ziggler and Otis. Uh, I'm telling you now, just from the reaction, reaction Otis gets, and just from uh, Otis on his mic and his in-ring ability and his mic ability, he could be one of your biggest stars. Uh, push this guy to the moon, and he could be your next big thing. He could be your next big star. He's got all the star power. The fans want him to explode. The fans love him. He's very lovable. He's very likable character. Uh, I see a great future for him. Uh, and once the tag team, once him and Tucker are done being a tag team, whenever that may be, I'm not saying anytime soon. 
but even them as a tag team, they're very fun tag team to watch. Uh, their in-ring work is improving each and every single week. And uh, um, it's unfortunate that they've never had the, uh, the opportunity to hold the tag team titles yet. But who knows in the near future. Dolph Ziggler picking up the victory over Otis was the right move. Uh, especially with what's been going on between Dolph and Otis. For, uh, for Dolph to pick up a victory and that be one up on Otis also looks good in the eyes of Mandy Rose. Uh, the storyline that they're, they're pushing there with Mandy and Dolph being together. And Otis being your run-of-the-mill average guy who's just struggling struggling to be successful. Struggling to get the girl. Um, and there's your, your jock, your asshole, your it guy who's standing in the way from all of that. The lead-up to this Elimination Chamber pay-per-view... Uh, it's been pretty bland. The tag team chamber match is the only thing really that is holding it together on the SmackDown side of things. And I'm excited in a way to see what they have to offer in the chamber. I don't think it's going to be... Look, I'm... I don't know. Last year they did a tag team chamber match and it was okay. This year the tag team chamber match. Uh, it may be, maybe it'll be even better. Uh, all I can say is where's the revival? The revival have been off television since they lost the tag team titles and were embarrassed by the New Day. And they're nowhere to be found. Uh, this is an Elimination Chamber tag team match. And instead you've got the Lucha House Party who randomly appeared on television two weeks ago. And have been missing for, for for a while. Hell, I thought they were still on Raw until I saw that they were in the Smackdown, the Smackdown Elimination Chamber match. Um, it's Where's the revival? That's the question. Where are the revival? Are, is their contract up? Um, are they just being punished by Vince? The, the, the Revival is one of your best tag teams. And to not have them in this gauntlet match or not even have them in the chamber is an injustice. I think they're the most undervalued and underrated tag team who Vince just doesn't see big things for them. And, and listen, if you don't see big things for them, let them go. Because they've got some great potential and I, I, I want to see them. I want to see them move on hell i love them in nxt uh, i thought they were great in nxt i thought their feud with diy was amazing i thought their feud with the aop was great i thought their feud with almost anybody when given when given the right length of time they gave you the match uh, match of the night 70 uh, percent of the time uh, so that was your smackdown uh, for this week it was honestly just quick it was a quick smackdown that flew by uh, 42 minutes was devoted to your main event uh, which I guess if you're going to have a gauntlet match, you got to devote close to an hour. Uh, you can't just have a gauntlet match and run through it within 15 minutes. That doesn't make any sense. And WWE's been putting on a lot of gauntlet matches. We had one on SmackDown. We had one in Saudi Arabia. We had one a few weeks back on Raw. Then we had another one on SmackDown. Um, I guess that's their new thing now, is putting together gauntlet matches to uh, crown number one contenders or to crown who's going to enter last in the chamber, which in this case is going to be Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode. Uh, the glorious tag, the glorious tag team, will be entering last in the chamber. Uh, that should give them an advantage over the tag team champions, um, the Miz and John Morrison. Um, I, this is a pick'em. This is a pick'em tag team title match. But with that being said, it being a pick'em tag team title match, it wouldn't make much sense if the Miz and Morrison lost their tag team titles uh, right away, uh, as soon as within a week's time frame, since they just won it last Thursday. Um, I don't know what, what's going to happen at the chamber. I'm, I'm hoping for a good match. Look, the, at this point, I'm going in this as a fan, and I'm hoping we, we get a good match. But apart from that, I can't tell you anything more than that of what's going to happen. I know we're going to continue with it in this match, the feud between Dolph and Otis. So expect some, some, something going on, some interaction between the two that's going to continue and potentially lead to maybe a tag team match with the Glorious Ones versus Heavy Machinery or potentially a one-on-one -on -one match between Otis and and Dolph Ziggler, which I think it may end up being the route that they go in. This is starting to resemble a lot like Chris Jericho versus Christian when they were battling it out for, for Trish Stratus. And then Trish ends up signing, siding with Christian, turning on Chris Jericho. Uh, that could be the direction they, that they, they do go in. We'll see what happens over the course of time. But uh, apart from that, that was your... Smackdown recap. That was your quick Smackdown recap. As about as quick as the way Smackdown treated Smackdown this week. Um, I could see what they're doing. They're continuing to try and improve uh, their show. 
Uh, they're bringing back Nostalgia Axe for ratings boost, which is fine. How Goldberg brought a big ratings boost. The NWO, I'm sure, is going to bring a big, big ratings boost. Hulk Hogan on the Firefly Funhouse brought in a big ratings boost. Um, so I, I see what they're doing. Uh, good for them. You need the big ratings boost. But at the same time, your priority is you should be getting over talent like Chad Gable, um, Apollo, Sami Zayn, Shinsuke Nakamura, Cesaro, uh, Heavy Machinery, and, and even F not Fire and Desire, but Carmella and Dana Brooke, and Naomi and Lacey Evans. Um, I know you can't have them always win. Uh, this should be your focus of the show is getting over young talent. Now, one thing I do want to say, listen, uh, I don't feel the SmackDown women are being given are, are, are being given the justified time that they need to give the fans great matches, to give the fans great promos. Um, I, I, why, just an idea, just a concept. Why not just have a, an all women's show? Hell, if you want to remove 205 Live, remove 205 Live and, and replace it with a WWE Evolution weekly show or keep 205 Live and add WWE Evolution as a weekly show, maybe on Tuesday. Maybe on Thursday, one day of the week that you that the WWE doesn't have a program, just make it an all women's television show, right? Uh, you could use this to develop the women roster. You could use this to give the women an opportunity where they're not squashed in with, with with the men's matches or the men's storylines because it just seems that they're being rushed and not given the same justified amount of time as the men are being given right now. So maybe an all women's show would be the right direction. Just an idea I'm throwing out there because the likes of Dana Brooke and Carmella, they deserve better than what they've been been, been, been given over the last several months. These are some of the two of two of the two talented women. Uh, the same goes for Naomi and Lacey Evans. I know Bailey and Banks needed the victory. You got to push over the heels, uh, push the heels. But apart from Carmella and Dana Brooke, there's a lot of women that we haven't seen on this roster. Heck, I don't even think we've seen Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross compete in quite, quite some time. Uh, a women's show would do them right. Now, if the question is, what would the ratings look like? Who would watch? Wrestling fans would watch. If you make us want to care for the women, and which we do. Hell, we tuned into the WWE Evolution Women's Pay-Per-View. We loved it. That should be a sign that we want more women wrestlers. We want more women wrestling matches. We want better women's wrestling matches. We're not asking for a lot. We just want better from a company that can deliver better. I'm JP. This was your AW Mania Smackdown recap for March 6, 2020.